So the session today is a really interesting one, and I'm excited about this because we're going to be analyzing Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek is a very popular uh, presenter and public speaker in the world of business. He's been around for a number of years. His main topic is leadership. So he talks about all different aspects of leadership. And uh, why is this important? Why is it important to study and analyze effective and popular speakers? It's important because as students of communication, we want to analyze what's working and what's not. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, we can look at people like Simon Sinek or Steve Jobs. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to be analyzing him in one of these webinars as well. Uh, and we can look at what are their techniques and their strategies that make them so effective, right? And so we don't have to develop new techniques or strategies necessarily from scratch. We can look at what's already working and adapt some of those techniques to our own presentations and to our own personal style. Uh, the other major thing that I'm going to say before we get into the nitty gritty is to leave your personal subjective preferences at the door. So this is not about what I personally like or what you personally like. You may like Simon Sinek personally, you may not, you may agree or disagree with his thesis or with his ideas about leadership, but uh, that's not what's important. What, what is important is the fact that he's effective and impactful and persuasive in the marketplace and that audiences respond to him. So we're purely looking at this from a pragmatic point of view to understand strategically and tactically what is effective and what is impactful for audiences. That's what matters, right? And if we can understand and identify those techniques, then we can apply those from a strategic standpoint. So I'm gonna share this video here. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to play a little bit of this uh, video and I'm going to pause it and then give a little bit of my commentary, play a little bit more, pause, give commentary, etc. There's three major things that I want you to keep in mind here, separate from the body language of Simon Sinek as a speaker, um, and we'll uh, make a little bit of a note of that, but three major things in terms of the content of what he's saying. One is repetition. Okay, so you'll notice that he repeats his key message multiple times. Keep an eye out for that. Secondly is contrasts and variety, creating contrasts, both in his delivery, but also in his content. Keep an eye out for that. We're going to explore that. And then the third is he does this thing where he starts with something familiar and then he adds an unexpected twist. Okay, uh, so keep an eye out for that as well. So without further ado, let's check out. The, we're not going to watch the entire presentation, but uh, this is from a leadership conference that he spoke at a few years ago. Uh, so let's check it out. <laughs> By the way, it's always a good sign when you get a standing ovation before you've even said any words yet. <laughs> yeah. So I'm embarrassed that I have a career. I talk about things like trust and cooperation, and there should be no demand for my work. But the fact of the matter is, is there is demand for my work, which means that there's an opportunity. It means that trust and cooperation are not yet standard in our organizations, and yet they should be, and we know that, which is why we're looking for ways to bring those things to our organizations. So I thought I would do something a little different today. You know, when you're speaking to tens of thousands of people and you have the opportunity to share a message, of course, most rational people would say, let's go with something I've talked about lots of times and I'm really good at, but I'm not normal, so I'm going to do something completely new, and I hope this works out. Um, okay, so right off the bat, literally within one minute or less, he has created a lot of anticipation and interest in the audience, right? I'm embarrassed that I have a career. What a great attention-grabbing way to start a presentation. So my colleague Julie Cortez likes to talk a lot about an attention-grabbing hook. That's an attention-grabbing hook, right? He doesn't get start talking about leadership. He doesn't say, good evening, thank you for joining. You know, I'm excited to discuss leadership with you today. He said, I'm embarrassed that I have a career. Right? So then immediately you're thinking, okay, what is this all about? You know, I, if you've never seen Simon Sinek before, you've never seen him talk, you're engrossed by that. He goes on to say, uh, I talk about trust, I talk about um, 
cooperation, there should be no demand for my work. And yet there is. These are very strong definitive statements, right? All of this helps to build up the anticipation in the audience. And we want to lean in and learn more and hear what else he's going to say. Uh, there's also some emotional vulnerability there that he's expressing. He's saying, I hope this works out. I'm going to try something totally new. Just within the first minute, he has created so much more of a personal and emotional connection with the audience, this audience of hundreds or thousands of people, uh, than what an average presenter would do, right? Don't be afraid to be vulnerable in your presentations. That's the lesson. Don't be afraid to start in a nonchalant uh, way, you know, with an unusual statement or a way of presenting ideas. Um, and, you know, the idea is to get the audience's attention and keep their attention throughout. So we haven't gotten into the content yet of the substance of this presentation. Now he's going to get into that. There are two things that I think that great leaders need to have. Empathy and perspective. And I think these things are very often forgotten. Leaders are so often so concerned about their status or their position in an organization, they actually forget their real job. And the real job of a leader is not about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in our charge. And I don't think people realize this, and I don't think people train for this. Okay, I just want to pause here. This is a critical moment in the presentation because this is where he reveals the key uh, substance that he's going to be focusing on for the rest of the discussion. Two big ideas, empathy and perspective. And you can see everybody immediately starts taking notes as soon as he says that. He doesn't waste a lot of time, you will notice. He builds up, there's some buildup of anticipation in the first minute or so. Just look at the timestamp, right? Remember, there was that initial intro, which is like 20 seconds or so. But basically, he had that little bit of emotional vulnerability at the beginning, and then immediately gets into the content, the substance, uh, empathy and perspective, right? Two very big, ambitious ideas. The lesson there is, don't be afraid to be ambitious. Don't be afraid to get into some bold, really ambitious topics and themes in your presentation, right? It makes the presentation much more engaging, much more impactful than if you try to play it safe. Uh, and then this is a key structure here. Leadership is not about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in our charge. This is memorable, and this is, the, this is an illustration of one of the points that I mentioned earlier. Starting with something familiar, and then adding an unexpected twist. So when we say being in charge, that's familiar, right? But he's saying, no, 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 it's not about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in our charge. That's the unexpected twist. And he does this again and again in his presentation. He creates that foundation of familiarity then adds a twist to it, and that makes it memorable. That sticks in your mind. This is also a, a parallel construction, in charge versus in our charge. Parallelism is a rhetorical device. It's manifested in many different ways, uh, but basically it comes down to uh, repeating the basic word structure of, of multiple successive phrases, and that makes it that much more memorable. When we're junior, our only responsibility is to be good at our jobs. That's all we really have to do. And some people actually go get advanced educations on, so that they can be really good at their jobs, accountants or whatever, right? And you show up and you work hard and the company will give us tons and tons of training how to do our jobs. They'll show us how to use the software, they'll send us away for a few days to get trained in whatever it is that we're doing for the company. And then they expect us to go be good at our jobs. And that's what we do, we work very hard. And if you're good at your job, uh, they'll promote you. And at some point, you'll get promoted to a position where we're now responsible for the people who do the job we used to do, but nobody shows us how to do that. And that's why we get managers and not leaders. Because the reason our managers are micromanaging us is because they actually do know how to do, do, do the job better than us. That's what got them promoted. Really what we have to do is go through a transition. Some people make it quickly, some people make it slowly, and unfortunately, some people will never make that transition at all. Which is, we have to go this, through this transition of being responsible for the job, and then turning into somebody who's now responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. So, this, on a larger level now, he was describing the traditional normal path of going from junior to senior. You start out being really good at your job, you get better and better, you get promoted. 
that's another example of uh, starting with something familiar and then building into something that's unexpected, right? And, you know, that's how we get managers and not leaders. Uh, there's an inadequacy there. There's not enough training on leadership, right? So everybody in the audience will be familiar with this career trajectory. That's the norm, right? So that's the familiar part. Then there's the unexpected twist that he adds on to it. And then the other major thing here is the way he phrases this, uh, being responsible for the job versus being responsible for the people that are doing the job. And he's gonna repeat this again and again. This is a key phrase. And again, it's a parallel construction, right? Um, and he's gonna repeat that again and again to reinforce that concept. I just wanna emphasize, don't be afraid to repeat things. A lot of times presenters are afraid to repeat because they think that it's going to get um, stale or it's just going to get annoying or uh, ineffective if you just repeat the same concept again and again. But don't be afraid to repeat those key points throughout the course of your presentation because it will make the presentation that much more memorable and your key message that much more memorable. So we continue. And as I said before, one of the great things that is lacking in most of our companies is that they are not teaching us how to lead. And leadership is a skill like any other. It is a practicable, learnable skill. And it is something that you work on. It's like a muscle. If you practice it all the days, uh, you will get good at it and you will get, become a strong leader. If you stop practicing, you will become a weak leader. Like parenting, everyone has the capacity to be a parent doesn't mean everybody wants to be a parent, and doesn't mean everybody should be a parent. Leadership is the same. We all have the capacity to be a leader. Doesn't mean everybody should be a leader, and it doesn't mean everybody wants to be a leader. And the reason is because it comes at great personal sacrifice. Okay, notice the slowing down for emphasis there. Very simple pacing technique. Great personal sacrifice. So he's Remember the concept of variety and creating contrasts. In this case, he's creating a contrast in his flow and his delivery. He's going from speaking fast to speaking slow, right? Reducing the energy and making it that much more intense uh, when he really emphasizes and underlines that concept of great personal sacrifice. Also, uh, the analogy. Uh, leadership is a skill, just like physical exercise, just like parenting. Those are analogies, right? Don't be afraid to use analogies. Analogies are very, very effective when you are trying to take an unfamiliar concept to the audience and ground it in something familiar for the audience. Everybody is familiar with physical exercise. You have to train, you have to practice. Everybody's familiar with parenting, but we may not be familiar with the concept of leadership as a skill, right? So by drawing that analogy, he's making it that much more uh, digestible to the audience and that much more memorable as well. So there's the contrast and the energy. And again, there's a little bit of uh, reinforcement and repetition as well. Remember, you're not in charge. You're responsible for those in your charge. That means things like when everything goes right, you have to give away all the credit. And when everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. That sucks, right? It's things like staying late to show somebody what to do. It's things like when something does actually break, when something goes wrong, instead of yelling and screaming and taking over, you say, try again. When the overwhelming pressures are not on them, the overwhelming pressures are on us. At the end of the day, great leaders are not responsible for the job. They're responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. They're not even responsible for the results. I love talking to CEOs and say, what's your priority? And they put their hands on their hips all proudly and say, my priority is my customer. I'm like, really? You haven't talked to a customer in 15 years. <laughs> okay, it's obviously laughter there, humor. He's taught, he has uh, dealt with a lot of very specific, very uh, serious, heavy topics to this point. And then there's that little burst of humor, right? It's a nice break in energy, again, contrasts, variety, right? Um, also, he was talking in the abstract about uh, leadership, about being responsible for this or that. And then he gives specific examples. That is also an example of 
contrast, going from abstract, theoretical, what I call high level talking, to then low level, specific details, examples, case studies, anecdotes. Uh, you know, being willing to engage with your employees in a different way. And he's specifically illustrating that. That helps to reinforce his message. He doesn't just stay on the high level concept and the theory. He actually gives specific examples of what it looks like on the ground. That's very important and very significant. Um, and do keep in mind, if you're gonna use uh, humor, as he did there, make sure to pause for the audience to react. Right? A lot of times we'll do a joke and it's a very well-constructed joke, uh, but then we don't pause and we don't wait for the uh, audience to sink in, you know, for, for the idea to sink in there. So be willing to pause a little bit and it's a good break in energy. Um, and again, notice the repetition. He has repeated and reinforced this main theme now multiple times. In fact, if you count it up, we're less than five minutes so far in the presentation. And he has now repeated this theme four times okay so almost once per minute that repetition that reinforcement everybody in that audience if they don't remember anything else in this presentation they are going to remember that concept of not being responsible for the job but being responsible for the people that are doing the job uh, that's a key key message that he's doing there there's no ceo on the planet responsible for the customer they're just not they're responsible for the people who are responsible for the people who are responsible for the customer. I'll tell you a true story. A few months ago, I stayed at the Four Seasons in Las Vegas. It is a wonderful hotel. And the reason it's a wonderful hotel is not because of the fancy beds. Any hotel can go and buy a fancy bed. The reason it's a wonderful hotel is because of the people who work there. If you walk past somebody at the Four Seasons and, this, and they say hello to you, you get the feeling that they actually wanted to say hello to you. It's not that somebody told them that you have to say hello to all the customers, say hello to all the guests, right? You actually feel that they care. Now, in their lobby, they have a coffee stand. And I, one afternoon, I went to buy a cup of coffee, and there was a barista by the name of Noah who was serving me. Noah was fantastic. He was friendly and fun. And he was engaging with me, and I had so much fun buying a cup of coffee, I actually think I gave a 100% tip, right? He was wonderful. So as is my nature, I asked Noah, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah says, I love my job. And so I followed up. I said, what is it that the Four Seasons is doing that would make you say to me, I love my job? And without skipping a beat, Noah said, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and ask me how I'm doing, if there's anything that I need to do my job better. He said, not just my manager, any manager. And then he said something magical. He says, I also work at Caesar's Palace. And Caesar's, at Caesar's Palace, the managers are trying to make sure we're doing everything right. They catch us when we do things wrong. He says, when I go to work there, I like to keep my head under the radar and just get through the day so I can get my paycheck. He says, here at the Four Seasons, I feel I can be myself. Same person, entirely a different experience from the, from the customer who will engage with Noah. So we in leadership are always criticizing the people. We're always saying, we've got to get the right people on the bus. I've got to fill my, wrong, my team. I've got to get the right people. But the reality is, it's not the people. It's the leadership. If we create the right environment, we will get people like Noah at the Four Seasons. If we create the wrong environment, we will get people like Noah at Caesar's Palace. Okay, excellent. So a lot of really great lessons here from this story. First of all, he started telling the story about four minutes 50 here. The total story from start to finish uh, was about two minutes, which is not a huge amount of time. And yet we have, he has been able to paint a picture for us. We can see everything that's happening in our mind. He's giving enough detail uh, to make it really impactful, uh, but not so much that it becomes excessive and then it weighs down the presentation and it becomes very clunky. So notice how he started that out, first of all. He says, I'll tell you a true story. Anytime you can say a line like that, I'll tell you a story. You know what, let me tell you a story. As a matter of fact, to illustrate this point, I wanna share a story with you. Any line like that is great because it just creates that extra little boost of uh, anticipation in the audience. 
He's including relevant details in his story. He said, it feels like they care about the customers, not that they, not that someone told you, told them that you have to ask all the customers how they're doing, but it feels that way. So he's illustrating that and he's, he's uh, sharing those specific details, uh, which is very important. He also named the barista, Noah. So whether that is Noah's actual name or not, we don't know, it doesn't really matter. The point is that we have a name. And when you have a specific name, now it becomes that much more personal and that much more impactful. He tells the story about it. And again, Noah was wonderful. I think I gave a hundred percent tip. That's a detail, right? That is a specific, he didn't have to include that detail of the 100% tip, but he included that uh, because it, it really grounds and illustrates just how great of an experience he was having there. And then he said something magical. Again, notice the anticipation there, right? And what's, what's great about Simon Sinek here is that he is naming names, you know? He could have anonymized the hotel. I went to a great hotel in Las Vegas, you know, I, I, and then there was this other very well-known brand name hotel that the barista also worked at. No, he's naming names, the Four Seasons and Caesar's Palace. <laughs> That's something that a lot of people would not be comfortable doing or Maybe they just can't do it for whatever reason. But if you can do that, do it. Name those names because it makes it that much more real. And going back to the uh, major point that I mentioned at the beginning, contrasts. There's a clear contrast between the Four Seasons and Caesar's Palace. He is very clearly illustrating the contrast in the way that Noah was telling the story. Here, I feel like I can be myself. And notice how he paused and slowed down specifically on that phrase, you know, the, the pacing. I feel like I can be myself. And then contrasting it with Caesar's Palace where you have to keep your head down and just play by the rules. Um, and then he brings it home, Simon Sinek brings it home with the lesson. It's not the people, it's the leadership. If we create the environment, create the right environment, we'll get people like Noah at the Four Seasons, right? If we create the wrong environment, we get people like Noah at Caesar's Palace. It's a great illustration, a great reinforcement of that point, a great kind of summation and synthesis of the main moral of the story. Also, Noah at the Four Seasons and Noah at Caesar's Palace, this has now become an analogy. It's become a shorthand that he can return to later on in the presentation if he wants. He has established, because he's he has told this story, he's established in the audience's mind the concept of Noah at the Four Seasons or Noah at Caesar's Palace. So that's a shorthand, that's a shortcut that he can return to later on in the presentation to reinforce other points and make other connections because he has told this story and reinforced it for the audience. There's another example of uh, repetition and parallelism. Uh, we can create an environment, uh, Noah at the Four Seasons, create the wrong environment, Noah at Caesar's Palace, right? So following the same kind of construction there. Last thing I'll mention on the story here is that he took about a minute, if you, if you watch uh, the whole thing back, it takes about a minute just for the setup and the context setting. So he's taking his time, he's not rushing through classic mistake that a lot of presenters make is they rush through their content because they're nervous, because they think they don't have a lot of time, whatever. But do be willing to take your time because if you can take your time and really draw the audience in, the impact will be so much greater and so much more powerful. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. Obviously, we've looked at about seven minutes of this presentation. You can see the whole thing was about half an hour. I'll put the link uh, in the description in, in the um, yeah in the description in the chat to the YouTube video. But I'm curious, any other observations or any other thoughts in the last couple minutes here uh, that anybody has noticed? Anything that I didn't pick up on, or something that maybe touched you or impacted you in a really interesting way? I'm very curious to hear your input. Um, and I think we have a couple Simon Sinek fans in the audience today as well. So. If you have anything uh, specific that you've noticed, uh, by all means, share that in the chat or in the Q&A, and we can certainly discuss that. So again, three major 
high level techniques. One is repetition. Repetition and repeating the key message again and again. The second is contrasts and variety, right? Serious moments, humorous moments. Speaking fast, speaking slow. Uh, talking about high level concepts in the abstract and then giving specific examples, making it tangible, illustrating it. That's contrast and variety. It makes a very, very engaging and interesting presentation. And then starting with something familiar and then adding the unexpected twist. And he does that both in terms of his structure of his content and also in the word choice within individual sentences and phrases. Uh, that'll do it for today. I hope that was uh, beneficial and informative. Hope you learned a few interesting tips and tricks from Simon Sinek and his technique and his approach to public speaking. Uh, but we'll leave it there for today. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for coming. And I'll see you next week.